tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, ko manga tua te manga, ko Tairi, te Awa, ko Ngāti Wikitoria, te Iwi, ko Rawari Stevens ahau. I live under the shadow of Mangatua on the banks of the Tairi River. Um, I am a fifth generation Kiwi descendant from the UK, and my name is David Stevens. I got this uh, hospital pass from Robin that said, Dave, if you were to go on to any farm in New Zealand, wouldn't you be able to have a look at what they do and come up with some key findings as to what makes them successful? And I said, well, that's an ambitious thought, Robin, but I'll give it a go. And so we decided that, could we use some case studies? And uh, Ian has introduced some beautiful case studies um, right here and now, which help illustrate some of the points that we're going to make. I cast around, got some co-authors um, to listen to our ideas, to help us provide some information. And what we did was we went into the New Zealand the Journal of New Zealand Grasslands and sought out case studies of farmers who were adapting and changing and demonstrating resilience. And one of the challenges in that is that New Zealand runs from subtropical, and we've heard the Northland experience, through to cold temperate. We run from deep, fertile soils to shallow, infertile soils. We range from 350 millimetres of rainfall to three and a half metres of rainfall. And we expect our farmers to produce us a premium product which keeps the country going under all of those circumstances. Now, how do you make sense of that when we're trying to figure out what the important things are about resilience? Uh, all of those photos are associated with the case studies. So, and this is the distribution of those case studies. We had one deer farm, five sheep and beef, and four dairy spread across New Zealand and across all of those uh, environments. What's important? Well, and we've heard a lot from uh, several of our speakers about management stuff, things that farmers do, right? And you have this really long list. Well, we broke it down into strategic, tactical, and operational, and you'll note there are 113 different things that were mentioned in 10 papers about what farmers did. How do you make sense of that? What's important to you? So we took a systems approach, looking at some systems principles, things like simple rules, how they interact, how the systems are nested on a farm, what sort of feedback there is, and what sort of adaptation and evolution comes from that. And yesterday, I was challenged by uh, one of my um, collaborators on some other projects, and she said, there's nothing about people at this conference. And then I thought to myself, shit, I'm going to have to change everything in my talk, because we need to talk about people. as has been said before. People are the core of this. People are the reason that we are here. People are the reason we farm livestock. So I've got a whole set of stuff here. Uh, critical simple rules, read them. It's really important. You've had all of these lessons over the last two days. The interactions also extremely important, and again, you've had all of those lessons. If you don't attend to these interactions, then you will fail. Let's get on to some stuff that people do. Feedback, that's us, measuring things. Ian introduced us to that concept. Lots of farmers don't have information. 
and then setting targets. A lot of us don't set effective targets. You all know all this sort of stuff. And then fitting the system. And remember, though, fitting the system is dependent on your circumstances. And we had our farmers yesterday telling us quite specifically that, um, you know, we, we actually mould our system to go around the grass, but we all do something different. So you can't dictate a single thing. But some of the key stuff that I really, really, really want to talk about, let's go through some more of these. No, I'll go back one. You don't need to see that yet. Because it's important to some people in the audience, but it's... If we're talking about people, and we're talking about change and resilience and ad adaptation, I want to use an example here. We have to recognize the problem. So, hands up in this audience, who thinks that climate change is an important part of the future and we should do something about it? Hands up. Excellent. Okay, that's great. Okay, hands up. Who owns an electric car or drives an electric car? Excellent. That's, that's slightly more than the number of electric cars in the car park. Who owns a hybrid? All righty. And, and, and quite a few of these people are double ups. That's interesting. So what's the rest of yours problem? If you think that climate change is an issue, what you have to do is accept, to make change, that you are responsible for making that change, right? And that's the difference between knowing that there's a problem and doing something about it. You have to accept that. Why are we having so much trouble at the moment changing people's thinking around water quality? Because they haven't accepted that they can do something about it. Once they do that, then all of the other things, oh, it's about the money, it's about demonstrating things, etc., that works, right? And that was clear in all of our case studies. They had accepted that they could do something about it. Okay, so where'd it happen next? How are we doing? Sorry. Oh, that's uh, excellent. One of the other key things that came out of that acceptance was gathering knowledge. So those farmers went and sought knowledge wherever they could. So they went and got experts. They went and got, no, I, I, re I remove that. They went and saw somebody who had knowledge that was different to theirs, that could add to their knowledge. That was an important feature of, of all of those case studies, because interestingly enough, the knowledge advisor was probably the person who wrote the case study up. The other thing that they did was gather knowledge inside their business so that they knew what they had. They took stock. And then they started to make changes, and then they started to monitor their success. Right? All of those things. And we've all, we, we know this stuff, don't we? Do we know this stuff? Hands up, we knew this stuff already. Thank Christ for that. All righty. The other thing was sharing knowledge. So... The, uh, the phrase tato tato comes to mind. What's yours is mine. And that was really important in all of this, was sharing knowledge. And the interesting thing about generating feedback and using tools like Pharmax or plate meters or um, even sword sticks was the opportunity to generate a common language where you could actually exchange knowledge effectively. If you don't have a common language, you can't talk about it. Talk to the governors of your business or the people that are working in your business and have the same impression of what you do. You get a shepherd, he's down the back paddock, he has a look at the grass and he says, yeah, that was sweet, got plenty of grass down the back. And you know that he's a skinny grass farmer, and so you know that he's overstating the case just a little. But if he says on his sword stick that it's a two on the sword stick, you have a better impression. You have appropriate knowledge that you can exchange. So what's missing? Interestingly enough, pest and disease management was not on the list of things that made their systems resilient. Species choice was important. But pasture genetics was not important in terms of 
oh, I'm using the latest cultivar that was not part of the um, not part of one of those big rocks that you need to address. The use of phenology to manage their pastures apart from lucerne and subclover. And then grazing management technique was not actually a big rock that needed to be addressed in that process. So for all of you people who have been working so hard in that space, I apologize. But it is an interesting thought that when you build it back up to the system, it's really important to understand the big rocks first. Thank you.